All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I am Rabbi Sanford Axrod, the senior rabbi, the only rabbi, the congregation near Tamid. And uh, it is really a pleasure for me to partner with my colleague, Rabbi Alana Baden from Temple Sinai, who's also fairly new to Las Vegas. So we're going to give you a warm welcome. And thank you for continuing the partnership that we've enjoyed with our sister congregation up in Summerlin. Uh, I can't believe, you know, I've been here since 1988 when there was only about 250,000 Jews in, in Las Vegas, Henderson area. Now we're over 2 million. So, you know, the distances, the number of synagogues, it's all grown. And perhaps, uh, you know, we're an example of something that Dr. Windmuller might touch upon next week when we talk about uh, a little bit more about uh, Judaism in the 21st century. But for today, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Stephen Windmiller, who is um, with us as our scholar for this week and next week. And we're going to be looking at the diaspora Israel relationship. And of course, it's extremely relevant now with all that's going on in Gaza and Israel. And it's kind enough to even recalibrate his normal talk to absorb some of the things that have been going on recently. We appreciate that. Um, reading from his bio, he is the Emeritus Professor of Jewish Communal Studies at the Jack H. Skirball Campus of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles. To get that all, he needs two business cards to get it all. Okay, that's, that's a long title. During his tenure at the college, he served for 10 years as the director of its School of Jewish Nonprofit Management and in 2005 was named to the deanship of the LA campus. 2009, he was named to an endowed chair and in 2014 was awarded an honorary doctorate by Hebrew Union College. Author of four books and numerous articles, um, he holds a PhD in international relations from the University of Pennsylvania and his articles have appeared in many different secular and Jewish scholarly publications. And currently, he couldn't just give it up and be retired, retired. So he's a consultant with national agencies, federations, synagogues, and foundations in connection with his current studies on virtual and privatized Judaism, the impact of COVID, and the broader social, economic, and political trends reshaping American Jewish life. So that's quite a bio, and I'm really glad that we are able to host you, and that's the power of Zoom, and we look forward to it. So Shauna, are you there? Yes. Okay, could you share with the, the folks a little bit about the ground rules like you usually do? <laughs> okay, we appreciate it if you can raise your Zoom hand when you wanna ask a question. Um, we are going to, uh, uh, Dr. Mueller, Widmiller is going to lay the groundwork, so to speak. Um, so questions will be ha handled after he's done with his presentation. You raise your Zoom hand by clicking at the bottom of your Zoom screen, the reactions button. If you don't see a reactions button, click the button that has three uh, dots at the top called more, and you'll see reactions um, button. If you, uh, on that reactions button, you'll see raise hand. Um, that helps us know that you want to ask a question. If that seems to be too com complicated and it's frustrating you and you really want to say something, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, that will show me that you want to say something. Wait until I say I call your name and then you can uh, speak and ask your question. Um, otherwise, we're asking everybody to remain muted so we don't have background noise, uh, dogs barking, etc., uh, distracting us from the discussion. And uh, two other things, you can also post a question in the chat. Um, the initial presentation is going to be about 20, 25 minutes, so be patient. And this is being recorded, which is good, but I just want to make sure everyone's aware that it is being recorded. Special thank you to Shauna for doing the technology and, and also for Leslie Snadowski on the CNT staff, who's kind of the producer and interfacer with this. And um, Rabbi Baden, is is there uh, anyone from Temple Sinai you want to recognize at this point too? Oh, you're muted, Rabbi. 
You got to unmute her. Oh, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> um, you can... <laughs> now you can do it or hit the yeah. Thank you. Well, that's a good trick to control rabbis. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm in uh, great demand at high holidays. <laughs> oh boy. Um, no, I just I just want to thank Rabbi Axelrod for presenting this idea and inviting us to co-sponsor it, and to thank Dr. Winmuller for so graciously being our teacher this week and next week. And I see a lot of Temple Sinai names here. Um, thank you, especially to our members of the JLL, the Jewish Life and Learning Committee that's helping to make this program possible as, as well as all the wonderful uh, pro adult programs we have. Um, but it really is, it just, it feels, um, you know, this, this program was planned a while ago. Um, thank you, Dr. Winmuller, for switching the nights of the two topics, because I think um, Israel is weighing heavily on all of our hearts, and it really is wonderful at these times, especially to be able to be part of a congregation and a sacred community, and to also know that we're not alone, that we're part of a network of sacred communities. And so how wonderful to share this evening as sister congregations, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So without further ado, Dr. Stephen Winmuller. Yay. Uh, thank you. I don't know if I'm muted. No. Nope. I'm okay. Great. Uh, Rabbi Axelrod and Rabbi Baden, thank you so much for the invitation to join you for these two sessions. And to the members of Temple Sinai and Ner Tamid uh, for taking this time to be with us. As you heard, this will be about a 20 to 25 minute presentation and it will give us a context around which we can discuss and share the questions and concerns that certainly uh, abide with all of us. So with that, I'm going to invite um, uh, uh, Shauna to bring forward the PowerPoint that we can begin our conversation. In so many ways, the last three weeks have fundamentally reshaped the relationship between diaspora jury and Israel and certainly have framed the basis for our conversation this evening. And over the course of our history, we actually have experienced a number of sort of stages or phases by which we as diaspora Jews intersect with Israel. We began certainly with the whole notion of what is this experiment in Zionism and the Zionist uh, concept and became more deeply involved in the periods with the founding of the state through its early development and certainly the challenges to Israel's existence on the part of its relationship to its Arab neighbors from 1948 uh, to the period of 1982. 1982 marks the first Lebanon uh, crisis with Israel and Lebanon in, in conflict. And from that point forward, we would go through a series of different relationships as diaspora Jews began to question aspects of Israeli policy and practice, and issues evolved in terms of the kind of relationship that American Jews would have with Israel, that both grew and also retracted at different points until we come to the 7th of October, October 2023. So here we are at a particular moment in time, which is fundamentally reshaped and is reshaping the nature and character of our relationship with the Jewish state. Let's move to the next slide. Indeed, I think we all have different ways by which we connect with Israel. Some of this is historical in the context of the land, its history and its evolution. For others, it is symbolic in terms of the ideas the principles and basis of actually of Judaism itself and how Judaism inter, interplays with the land and the culture of the state of Israel, but also in relationship to the people of Israel. And there, some of us have family, others of us have long standing relationships with friends and colleagues. And no doubt, over the course of Israel's history from 1948, we have all developed a kind of particular cultural relationship to the aspects of Israel's story, its heroes, its challenges, and its politics 
that have defined and shaped for us the kind of cultural connections we have created. And no doubt there are moments such as this that are particularly binding and significant to many of us who see these as a crisis time, not only in terms of how Israel will be defending itself, but how we as advocates for Israel will be advancing that cause. Let's move to the next slide. No doubt all of us have questions about the Gaza Strip and more directly Hamas and the issues surrounding this particular moment in time. For sure, the Gaza Strip, which is a piece of land that is basically the size of the city of Philadelphia with some 2 million residents, which consists of a seven mile width and a 25 mile length to its construct. But Gaza has a very rich and significant history in connection to both biblical Israel and contemporary Israel. It was the home of the Philistines, in the biblical context, it later would be occupied by Greece and Rome, and the Greeks and the Romans would bring to it indeed their imprint on much of Gaza's physical uh, construct. It is important to note that with the rise of the Ottoman Empire, Gaza would become part of the greater empire uh, that was developed under uh, Turkish leadership. And no doubt with the First World War and the end of the Ottoman Empire's control, this would become part of a British mandate territorial assignment. And in turn, ultimately, Britain would cede Gaza to Egypt, and it would be under Egyptian control for periods between the 1920s and 30s. And at other points, it became part of the responsibilities of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. So the Gaza Strip has never been independent, has suffered from the constant pushback and pulls of different nations and authorities governing it or controlling it. We would point to the fact that in 1987, Hamas comes into existence, and in 2007, it takes control and power over Gaza, defeating the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, in garnering the votes and control of the territory under Hamas rule. I would urge you, if you have not had occasion to read the Hamas Covenant, to do so. It helps to explain the origins and basis of Hamas as an Islamic fundamentalist uh, institution and structure. It is a complex set of structures and institutions that govern the Gaza. One needs to understand that there's a military wing to Hamas. There's a social welfare connection under Hamas rule and guidance. And that Hamas is deeply tied to the Islamic notion of a government that is theologically driven. In other words, the loyalty here is to Allah to the notion of creating Islamic rule over all of Palestine with the capacity of the ability of the uh, Islamic leadership to define and impose laws tied to the history and evolution of Islam. If one reads the covenant, you will clearly see the specific and distinctive statements about the eradication of the Zionist entity, of the Jewish people, and of the role that the state of Israel plays within the region. Their objective, as is with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or other terrorist and far extreme religious movements in the Arab world, is the ultimate elimination of other religious communities so that Islam will be the dominant and controlling power in the region. One has to note here that this is the one place in the world where you have probably per capita the largest population per square inch known to our, our global community. The second factor one needs to recall is the deep connections between Tehran, that is the government of Iran, and the powers that be uh, from Hamas in Gaza. This is a long and historic connection.
that extends not only uh, to Hamas, but to Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, and extends as well to other interest groups that Iran controls in Iraq, in Syria, and in Yemen. So with that in mind, we put into context the historical, political, and military basis for what we are seeing over these past three weeks. Let's move to the next slide. In this particular moment, since the 7th of October, the American Jewish community has singularly raised and will raise more money than at any other moment in the history of diaspora fundraising for the uh, needs of the state of Israel and Jewish global uh, responsibilities. It marks also the most significant moment in terms of the rise of how technology and the use of social media has in some measure replaced some of the more traditional means of news delivery by the capacity of the technology to create whatever storyline a person wishes to tell. So the tragedy here is that a huge amount of untruths misrepresenting what is happening on the ground on behalf of the state of Israel, and for that matter, on behalf of Palestinians, has been portrayed through the use of social media and the public opinion wars. But what we need to understand is that we are in a series of political battles, much of which is being fought on college campuses, as we know, but much of it is also contending in other circles. In the only study we now have of American public opinion about this war, which came out a week ago by the AP, the Associated Press, in cooperation with Marist, with Marist College, that study suggests that a majority of Americans support the state of Israel. In fact, 72% of white Americans support uh, the case for and the cause represented by uh, the state of Israel. 51%, however, of those folks who are under 35 and who are uh, people of color do not hold that same degree of support for Israel. And in fact, it is the core of the support for Hamas here in the United States from younger audiences, campus-based groups, ethnic and racial and minority communities. And that becomes a huge challenge for the American Jewish community. As much as the American Jewish community has a deep and abiding base among more established elite leaders, including congresspersons, mayors, governors, and other officials, the reality is that the public opinion war in terms of younger Americans is a major challenge and concern for the American Jewish community moving forward. One of the outcomes of these last three weeks is that we have seen an explosion of poetry, of music, of all types of written messages seeking to give comfort and support to both Israelis and American Jews at this time, especially in light of the 220 uh, uh, captives or hostages, and in light of the fact that Israel and uh, its uh, partners have suffered some uh, huge numbers of losses. To date, as of this evening, we have already seen the deaths of 7,900 people, of whom Israelis and Palestinians comprise pieces of this, but also Americans. And we have seen more than 17,500 people wounded over these uh, days. We believe at the moment there are 10 American hostages among the 220 plus that are being held. And overall, 33 Americans have perished in the course of these uh, last several weeks. Let's move to the next slide. I think it's important to understand the Middle East in its largest potential context, because this is a war within a war. And we need to understand why this happened, what the objectives are of the Iranians, of Hamas, and of Hezbollah in terms of this moment. 
I would remind you that somewhere on the order of three months ago, the United States began to broker an arrangement with Saudi Arabia to move the Saudis closer to the Israelis and to create a kind of three-way relationship with the Saudis acknowledging and accepting the state of Israel and opening diplomatic relations with Jerusalem, with the United States providing a defense arrangement with the Saudis, with the Saudis and the Israelis finding some common ground in terms of their mutual concerns about Iran and about Iran fundamentalist behaviors. All of that with great promise to grow the Abrahamic Accords to now include the most influential, powerful Arab nation in the region, the Saudis. This would now come under challenge from Iran, who certainly did not wish to see this occur. So some of us believe that this conflict was given the green light by Iran precisely because of the concerns around the Saudi diplomatic initiative. But the region itself is in huge crisis, as we know. There are issues regarding the future and stability of Syria, issues of Lebanon and its inability to self-govern, challenges in Libya with two governments competing for credibility and authority, a huge earthquake in Morocco that has uh, created a great deal of uh, displacement, and so much more in the Middle East in terms of the various battlegrounds and tension points involving various Arab states with each other and involving, of course, Israel with the Arab world. The Turks become important because they remain one of the key powers in the region. Uh, but sadly, today, uh, there was a kind of disconnect between Jerusalem and Istanbul as the uh, current leadership in Turkey seemed to side with Hamas at this point, creating uh, some challenges uh, for the government of Israel in terms of moving forward with some initiatives that would have been helpful to bring Turkey as a potential partner in any kind of future uh, planning uh, or, or peace initiatives. The most important player for Hamas outside of Iran is Qatar. Qatar is, as you will note, um, in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. It is a very small country with huge, but seriously huge resources of petroleum and natural gas. It has the third largest uh, holdings of natural gas in the world. Qatar, it has both a strong relationship with Washington but it also has a powerful connection with both Hamas and with Tehran. Qatar is the home to the United States Fifth Fleet, the largest military presence of the United States Navy in the Middle East, therefore critical to the United States. But Qatar could be and has become a key player right at this moment in terms of hostage negotiations, because it is that connection between the government empowered in Qatar and its ability to negotiate with Hamas and with Tehran. Indeed, the economic scene in the Middle East is rapidly changing. We find in Gaza, in Egypt, and in Iran, populations with huge numbers of young people, underemployed, unemployed, and in some and many cases undereducated. And this is an extraordinary challenge to the region, but to each of the governments that I've just cited. That creates unto itself a major issue of bringing stability and economic development into the region. This becomes a critical piece because both Russia and China have historically and now more directly play key roles in within the region. I would point out to you that the, the Chinese are currently building uh, for the Saudis a major center of intelligence uh, structure. They are also providing certain types of nuclear support for the Saudis who would like to grow their nuclear capacities. Um, the Russians have historically played a key role with Iran 
remain an important player, certainly in Syria, as we know, and have had a difficult but continuous relationship with Jerusalem, both because of their interests around Syria, that is, the Israeli involvement and interest with Syria, and the Russian presence in Syria, and that has created certain points of tension between Moscow and Jerusalem. And indeed, one of the reasons that Israel has not been more forthcoming in the Ukrainian crisis has been precisely its need to retain a, a working relationship with Moscow. So there are numerous players in the Middle East, all of whom have particular interests. Iran wants to grow its presence to offset Saudi Arabia. Russia and China are seeking to offset American influence and power in the region. The Turks are seeking to create their own sort of third way in the region in building a kind of basis of influence in various parts of the Middle East. So we see a power war as part of the challenges of this immediate moment with Hamas and Israel. Let's move to the next slide. The next slide, please. Shana, you can move to the next slide, please. Okay. Thank you. So in so many different ways, um, this war is being fought in different places and over different uh, issues. It is certainly a conflict that today rages on American college campuses, as many of you know. It is raging as well in various city governments where there are resolutions being brought forward to condemn Israel or to side with Hamas. It is introduced into various other institutional settings by declarations, statements, or efforts to impose on Israel either boycott sanctions or divestments. And it is also present in the Congress as members of the progressive left within the Democratic Party have been challenging both the president and the mainline leadership of the party in the Congress over our pro-Israel stance. There are particular Jewish groups that we know are not supporting Israel, but have not supported Israel for some time. And these groups are particularly feeling that Jewish social justice has been misrepresented and that Israel ought to do more for Palestinians to give back land and to create the means for a two-state solution. The two groups that are most prevalent and have been very vocal are Jews, um, are, um, sorry, sorry, the Jewish Voice for Palestine and if not now, when? These groups were demonstrating uh, just a few days ago at the Congress in support of their position. Um, but it is certainly an important issue for us to uh, fully appreciate that the Jewish community has about a, a cadre of Jews who stand in opposition tonight to um, the position of the State of Israel on various ideological and political grounds. Let's move to the next slide. I think we need to understand the viewpoint of those who are opposing Israel here in the United States in terms of some of the ideologies or belief systems they hold. Many of them begin with the principle of intersectionality. That is that all individuals or groups that have experienced racism, or have understood other forms of abuse or denial of equal status, collectively share victimhoodness, and that they re represent a kind of postmodern agenda, pushing back against colonialist decisions and colonialist powers and against racist regimes. In this context, Israel does not fit in that definition. It is seen as a colonial uh, outcome, meaning that after the Second World War, the decision by the major powers to acknowledge and accept a Jewish state in Palestine was an act of a European colonial system creating a colonial product, a 
byproduct, the Jewish state in Palestine. You would remind yourselves that the United Nations in 1947 partitioned Palestine between a Palestinian entity and a Jewish one. The Israelis, the Jewish community accepting the partition, the Arab uh, cohort uh, rejecting it. At this moment in time, however, what has come into play is this sort of European notion that this is a false state imposed on a minority of people, the Palestinian people, and thereby creating this kind of, uh, of resurrection of, uh, of an imperialist uh, state. So intersectionality with all of its implications, suggesting the Jews are not a minority, no longer are, can fit or describe themselves as part of this uh, notion of being a minority community uh, creates the first problem. The second problem is that Jews are perceived as white and whites are in power. And the dynamics of that power give them the capacity to do things to subjugate other peoples. And the subjugation here is of Jews imposing their will on Palestinians and thereby creating this um, disequilibrium or imbalance of power. And as a white group imposing on people of color, this adds to the colonialist impression and image of Jews as occupiers. The third principle here is because Jews no longer fit the universal definitions of being a people who are part of the minority culture, they therefore can no longer claim their victimhoodness or their minority status, and therefore become part of a larger a power base who is subjecting others to uh, their control. So we need to put that in context because in the thought processes of American universities and colleges, these ideas of Jews as colonialists, of Jews as creating um, an, imp an empowered or a disconnect in power have created or is creating this kind of conflict of, of whites imposing their will on others. Let's move to the next slide. The data we have on American Jews is quite interesting on the Pew study we find, as you will see here, the significantly high number of American Jews who care about Israel. That would suggest 80% of American Jews have some either emotional or intellectual or social connections to the Jewish state. And indeed, we find that 45% of American Jews have visited Israel with 26% having visited or lived in Israel or having visited Israel many or multiple times. Within the American Orthodox Jewish community, we find an even higher level of connection. As we see by denominations, the levels of engagement or commitment to Israel as we move through the denominational scales. The next slide, please. What we also note is that we have various kinds of voters who see Israel as important, less important, or non-important. And indeed, we know that identity voters, identity voters being those folks who vote a particular issue tied to their identity and to their culture, as in the case of the state of Israel and Jewish voters uh, for or on behalf of Israel as a dominant political theme, we find this among certain Republicans and certainly within the Orthodox uh, Jewish community. We find increasing numbers of Jews who see Israel as important to them, but not necessarily defining their voting behavior. And among Reform, conservative, and independent voters, that is often the case, where Israel ranks anywhere between fifth and seventh on a list of core issues of importance to American Jewish voters. The third category are those voters who basically place themselves outside of the community, at least on Israel, by suggesting that as progressive Democrats, for example, and we believe about 8% of American Jews fit into this category, they will not support Israel as certainly as long as it's perceived or is understood 
to be an occupier in their minds of another people's. So we have a variety of issues happening. Up till October the 7th, we were living in a kind of bifurcated and divided community where Israel was often not spoken about on synagogue pulpits, was often not addressed in organizational life, and where friends and family often could not sit at the table together and discuss Israel because of deep and sharp differences over how Israel was relating to the family dynamics and to the political agendas of respective family members. The next slide, please. We have another study that tells us a bit more about the in-depth character of how Jews feel about Israel. And 87% of Orthodox Jews believe that God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. And you will see those lower numbers of conservative and reformed Jews who hold to that particular view. But we also see a difference between Jews who are Democrats and Republicans. We believe that seven out of 10 Jewish Republicans and some independents say that they're somewhat to very much attached to the state of Israel, whereas 52% of Jewish Democrats would hold that uh, position. So we have a varying level of degree by religiosity, by political affiliation, and now we will see it by age. Let's move to the next slide. And indeed by age, we know that older American Jews are very much or somewhat emotionally attached to Israel, 66%. But we also know from the Pew study and other data that under 50% of those Jews, 18 to 29 year olds, do not hold the same degree or same emotional attachments. And we can see that surely by the drop in numbers of Jews who claim to, to be uh, deeply connected to the Jewish state. Let's move to the next slide. We wanted to get a view of where the Israelis saw all of this. And here, the American Jewish Committee did some interesting work with secular and Haredi Jews, that is Jews who are not religious and Jews who are quite religious. And here we have this very sharp divide who, where we see with secular Jews that 65% believe that they are deeply connected and tied to the Jewish people beyond the borders and boundaries of the state of Israel. But among Haredi, very Orthodox Jews in Israel, only 19% carry or hold such a view about the global Jewish responsibility one for the other. The next slide, please. The AJC study then went deeper and wanted to take a look at different levels of engagement. And we found that 10% of Israelis are very interested, very connected to American Jews. And another 37% were somewhat so. And a, an additional 30% were only somewhat or minimally interested in global or diaspora Jewry and American Jews in particular. And uh, we had identified how many Israelis had visited the United States. And we saw that nearly 50% of Israelis had actually visited here. And 29% of Israelis had been to the United States more than once, whereas only 18% had experienced uh, coming to this country, but one on one occasion. So it was important to both understand our emotional, political, and social attachments to Israel. And it is likewise important to understand and connect with how Israelis respond. The next slide, please. All of the debates around Israel up till the 7th of October were really about the issue of the unreasonableness clause. The decision on the part of the current government, the 37th government of the state of Israel, to introduce into the Knesset legislation that would shift the control over the role of the courts, moving the court's capacity to determine whether a particular bill was reasonable or not, back into the Knesset's responsibility and control over such decisions were no longer going to be left to a kind of power sharing or balance of power between the courts and uh, the Knesset. The Knesset has under advisement as of this period of time, dating back to the second week in September, 
whether or not it will rule that this particular legislation, which was passed at the end of August, is in fact unconstitutional or by whatever Israeli standards we would define the action as not being uh, uh, acceptable to the illegal constraints of, Isra of the Israeli court system. Israel has a court system that is tied to the British, Canadian, New Zealand, and Australian system. And therefore, its 15 Supreme Court judges um, have certain powers to, powers to determine which Knesset legislation is viewed as unreasonable, therefore un not acceptable, and therefore would be viewed in our terminology as unconstitutional. So this is what took place over the past year that drew thousands upon thousands of Israelis every Saturday night to oppose the government for its actions in this area and in other related areas of concern to the current uh, government of Bibi and Netanyahu. So there are huge issues here. And the question over this legislation, which now has all been put sort of to rest until we resolve the events unfolding before us at the moment, will come back to become a issue yet again uh, once we move beyond this moment. Let's go to the next slide. I think we need to close with some idea about how we each see Israel. Some of us have a fantasy image of Israel. It's the image we have of 1948 and of the founders. Others of us have a fantasy image of Israelis as conquerors and able to defend and protect uh, their citizens. Others have an image of Israel in terms of its technology, its uh, research, and its tech uh, capacity uh, to provide extraordinary educational and uh, intellectual uh, tools to the world. Others frame Israel around being a Western nation. In many ways, Israel is not a Western nation, but perceptions, of course, create imagery of what Israel is. Israel's population is far more diverse today than ever before. It consists of peoples uh, who are Jewish and non-Jewish from North Africa, as well as the Arab world, including folks who are from other parts of uh, the globe, creating a really diverse uh, constituency, far more complex than the Western notions of democracy. Uh, we also see folks who have a perspective about a particular concern of Israel, whether it's in the area of its science and technology, or whether they have a particular perspective or interest associated with Israel in, in other uh, facets of its work. Then let's move to the last slide. This very moment demands a lot from all of us and from Israel itself. Clearly, we are reopening the dialogue. We are re-engaging in the debates because at this moment is not a question of a particular law. It is the question of Israel's ability to defend and protect itself and the role that diaspora Jews play in that uh, conversation are very different, but very essential. And indeed, we are going to see a number of new Jewish actors on the scene. As the rabbi pointed out in his introduction, this is an extraordinary moment of Jewish reawakening. And people will be coming to the table wanting to play roles in different ways. We will have a huge task, not only for Jews, but for Americans and for others as well, of reintroducing what Zionism is, what Israel is and what Israel studies represents so that we can better educate young people and adults about the complexities of the Jewish state. And third, we will be needing to rebuild our ethnic and interracial relationships with huge groups of Americans who are disconnected at the moment and have a negative perception about the state of Israel. And we will have to retell the Zionist story, why there was and has been a need for a Jewish state, how that fits into the construct of Jewish history. And finally, oh, we need to remind the world of the role that Israel has and will continue to play in the humanitarian and global connections that it has across the world with its hundreds of thousands of nonprofits uh, delivering um, incredible services to people 
uh, wherever they may be. With this, I'm going to end and invite you to uh, introduce your questions, and Shauna will be calling on you as we move forward. Thank you for your attention. Wow, thank you. A lot of good information there, a lot of, to think about. Um, I think to start, again, as a reminder, if you would could raise your Zoom hand, that'd be most helpful, and that's found at the bottom of your Zoom screen, either on the button that's called Reactions, or the button that has three dots on the top, That and then you'll find Reactions in there, and you'll see Raise Zoom Hand. Um, you can also just unmute. You'll move to a different location on my screen where I know that you want to say something, so I'll call on you. Um, I was just thinking we've got a call or question in the chat that we'll start with, and then Jonathan Marks has a question. Um, can you talk a bit about what uh, we've been reading about, that there is an abandonment on the left when it comes to Israel? A traditional alliance among Jews, will this create a temporary or permanent schism? And it, Israel was traditionally a bipartisan issue. What What's the reason for the drift? Well, it remains a bipartisan issue, but parts of the bipartisan coalition have begun to, to shed or fade. And we have a good deal of work to do with the progressives inside the Democratic Party in the House. And... Um, this will be a task that is going to be ongoing. I do know that uh, a number of our JCRC's, Jewish Community Relations Committees, have been working uh, quietly and privately with members of the Congress who are part of the progressive uh, uh, left in trying to find ways forward to both introduce ways they can be supportive of Israel um, and certainly reconnect with uh, core constituencies here at home. Um, the Jewish community has been aware for some time that this is going to be a challenging issue of the rise of the progressives, and they include Jews as well as non-Jews, and that becomes particularly challenging uh, along the way. Uh, there is some particular work being done by several of our national agencies that are particularly earmarked uh, to devote their energies to working on this question of how do we bring elements of the left closer and how do we use the jewish left which is pro which parts of which are certainly very pro israel to have uh, their influence on their fellow uh, folks in 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 that particular camp and that's a particularly challenging issue in cha in conversations with some of our colleagues on, who are pro israel on the left they will tell you how very difficult those conversations are with progressives who do not accept at the moment for sure the uh, the case for Israel that's being put forward. So my sense is that yes, this is a long-term issue. We are seeing it certainly live and in color at the moment and it it, it will take some a good deal of effort to to try to recreate and reaffirm the bipartisan character of the pro-Israel agenda. No doubt the president carries the pro-Israel agenda forward, and he will hold the line in terms of uh, the Democratic Party, uh, at least during his tenure of service. Yeah, thank you. Jonathan? Thank you. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate this presentation. I've learned a lot. Um, my question is, you showed a graph or a uh, some figures before about the interest in Israel, where Orthodox was 87 percent and conservative was, I think, 54 and Reform 22. That's the way it is now. Do we think that this catastrophe in Israel is going to change those numbers? And is the conservative and reform movement going to try to be more supportive of Israel to at least have the members be more supportive? Right. I mean, th there were two charts, one dealing with God gave Israel to the Jewish people. Yes. That chart, we saw clearly a lower level of reform and uh, conservative commitment. And on the attachment level, the numbers are, are are somewhat different here. They show, as you see, they show here on the on the screen. Right. No doubt the survey that this is taken from is, is Pew 2021. So just take us back to 2021. 
we were living with uh, a, a, a period of time in which the government of Israel was going through a series of elections, in fact, five elections in 18 months. And we were seeing a sort of a loss of, of direction and continuity with Israel. And uh, part of that is expressed, I think, and seen with some of the fall off among reform and conservative and independent or non-affiliated Jews. No doubt, as uh, I think we all are identifying in the course of the three weeks since the 7th of October, we have seen an uptake in the interest level and concerns on the part of Jews from across these uh, different spectrums. So I would suspect, and I know we have very strong support from uh, the, Un the Union for Reform Judaism and from United Synagogue, the two umbrella structures mm -hmm. of our movement. I was with Rabbi Rick Jacobs uh, just this past Thursday, and he is currently in Israel uh, on behalf of the reform movement, specifically um, extending you know, the reminder to Israeli officials and authorities of the, of the movement's uh, deep commitment to the state's security and its, and its uh, uh, survival. Great, thank you. Can I just ask one more question? Is that okay? It's fine uh, with me. What's the what's the position of J Street? You mentioned where where are they in this whole yeah. thing? Because I know they've been very pro Palestinian. In, interestingly enough, in a conversation today with some observers of a, of J Street and APAC, that the alignment today at this moment is is actually quite close between these two institutions, which historically have sort of battled for space in the Jewish community. Um, you know, obviously different spaces, APAC very willing to accept the government's positions across the board. And as you point out, J Street, rather critical of Israel's positions, certainly on settlements and other issues. Mm -hmm. To the in, in the moment, at least, there is a, a greater consolidation of positions, meaning this, the right of a Jewish state to exist in a national Jewish homeland is a given on both on the part of all parties or both parties in this mm -hmm. uh, discussion and the uh, capacity of J Street to sort of at the moment shift its focus certainly to what needs to happen, bringing back the hostages, defeating Hamas, uh, managing uh, certainly the economic and political crisis Israel faces. So I, I think uh, we have a greater degree of solidarity than we've seen for years at this moment. Mm -hmm. So Thank I really you. appreciate your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ali. Hi, <clears throat> thanks so much. Um, my name is Ali Stam. I'm a member of Nair Tamid. And um, I'm really grateful for your insight and your expertise um, leading us through the complexities of, of not only recent events, but just sort of the, the broader um, issues that that are being faced by our people in the Middle East. My um, question centers on the slide that was shown with the generations. So I happen to fall right at the cusp of uh, Gen X and millennial and uh, interact with a lot of young people through my uh, through my work. And of course, I'm on social media and see um, that although so many of the younger Jews that I know are are highly literate, um, that they converse in sound bites and in memes and in, um, you know, just little bits and bites. And I'm, and I'm so curious as to how you think, you know, what, what your guidance is and what your, um, your outlook is on, <laughs> on, you know, what we can expect of the, that, those generations Mm -hmm. um, as ambassadors of our religion and of our people, you know, when they're asked to be the subject matter experts, when when other, you know, their non-Jewish friends are coming to them and asking for advice or asking them to um, to give insight as to what's happening. That's a fascinating question. I think we're we're still in a kind of exploratory phase in terms of fully understanding where some of these folks both currently are where they're likely to be over you know over time. Um, what we have seen is a huge amount of of questioning on their part, and and that actually is healthy. Whether they're turning to national Jewish agencies, to their rabbis, to their Hillel directors, 
uh, to other institutions for, for gaining some historic context or understanding issues about Gaza, what it is and how it became sort of this sort of uh, orphaned piece of land in a sense. So and all of that is is particularly helpful because if folks at least give themselves the time to digest the information and context, then they can make the decisions hopefully uh, for themselves that will give them some degree of 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 uh, basis for action or basis for for the views they hold. Um, one of the interesting pieces to this is the rise of some efforts to provide to them resources. And um, what's really interesting is that there are a number of groups that have sort of been present, but now is their moment to really shine. For example, there's one group that I've been looking at called Open Door Media. D-O-R, not D-O-O-R, Open Door Media, which is a kind of Israel educational space online or Israel um, unpublished. Uh, another group that is seeking to talk to audiences such as younger Jews or Israel 2021 20, is, is yet a third such site. Uh, these groups are designed in a sense to give um, fast, um, sort of savvy social media type responses to an audience that is raised on social media that, that responds best, as you just noted, to sound bites rather than long historic context. So we're seeing these kinds of groups is now filling the place that we were hoping they would in, in being a kind of a context or resource. But I will tell you, Hillel, directors around the country are telling us that, you know, the questions and the concerns that folks have are just really overwhelming. The, if I might add, there's one other piece to this, and that is something we did not talk about tonight, is the role that children are playing. Children are asking parents when they have heard about children being taken hostage or children being killed or other, other terrible experiences that they see either on television or have heard their parents talk about. And there is a huge discussion now about how do we present Israel to children and how do we help children understand this moment? So one of my colleagues at the Hebrew Union College, College Dr. Sivan Sakai, uh, is a specialist really on Israel studies, and she is doing a lot of work specifically on helping children to understand this moment because they have also their questions, different than their teen brothers and sisters or you know older uh, young adults, <clears throat> but need to, to find answers as well. Thank you. And in the chat, we have a question that's sort of related to this, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, what are, what, how successful has Birthright been mm -hmm. in addressing this? That yeah. Um, so, well, Birthright now has um, done some 200,000 uh, visitors under its auspices, under all of the programs that are tied with Birthright. Um, Brandeis University was charged with the task of evaluating when folks participate in birthright, when they come back. So what are the longer term outcomes from the birthright experience? And uh, these vary, as we would have expected. But we have a better shot, frankly, and a clearer pathway forward from those folks who have experienced birthright than those who have not. That's principle one. Principle two is that the more that a community can do once a person returns from Israel, from birthright, with birthright, to find a way forward for them to participate, whether it's a discussion group, whether it's some kind of Moshe House experience or other kind of young leadership experience, ensures a more likely continuity of a pro-Israel or positive Israel expression or experience. So, uh, we all agree that 10 days of engagement with Israel is interesting and exciting and important for young adults, but it is not going to give the context and the continuity necessary to build audiences of loyalty or engagement 
uh, it requires all the other work that needs to be done by all the institutions we have. Yeah. Uh, Sharon has her hand raised. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I really so much. Um, I really all the information you've had to share. And is regarding um, the care with which I see, I hear myself included, people differentiating Hamas versus versus the Palestinian people and civilians. And um, I was wondering if you can speak to that because of course you can speak to that because of course Hamas was elected. Palestinian people, I don't know if at this time it's still can I mean, we want to think that there's lots and lots of good people that are very upset at mm. in Palestine about about in Gaza Strip, but I was wondering if you can speak to that, if that's actually the case or if that's the story we tell ourselves. We do have a couple of surveys of Palestinians um, having to do with their attitudes towards Hamas and to the PLO in, in the West Bank. And in both cases, neither organization scores particularly well. Uh, the numbers are not at all favorable to these two institutions. What we can tell you is that Hamas is very much a um, closed shop, meaning it's it's a very um, self-contained operation. And so I'm going to s take your question and lead it somewhere slightly different for the moment. Acknowledging your question is worthy of a, of a lot more uh, commentary. The first place I want to take it to is that over the last several days, you probably have noticed there have been news reports that this or that Hamas leader has been killed. And one was killed uh, in the last 24 hours or several others earlier this week. And uh, what my sources tell me is that the Israeli uh, military is actually already on the ground in Gaza and is moving to try to eliminate as many of the Hamas um, leadership elites as possible, as quickly and uh, as possible. So um, part of what is happening is the Palestinian people, both in Gaza and in the West Bank, are in some measure um, caught in this terrible uh, situation of, in the case of the West Bank, having a government that has not had an election in years. There's been no confirmation that the folks there uh, in, in the West Bank would reelect the existing PLO leadership. And uh, likewise uh, with Hamas, the 2007 engagement with, uh, with Gaza on the part of Hamas uh, has never been affirmed in, in those years, uh, giving really, again, the question of the right of the population to express its desire and its wishes. Um, Hamas imposes huge demands on its people in terms of dress code. If you recall what we learned about the Taliban, you have a very similar frame of reference point here in terms of expectations about behaviors, appearance, and roles. And uh, that is true of these kinds of fundamentalist regimes seeking to impose their ideologies and their cultural and religious norms on society. So I, I, I think we, we know that there's a lot of goodwill on the part of Palestinians to want something different and better, uh, and certainly a piece of that. And it's not totally that alone. Obviously, there are issues regarding the role Israel uh, um, will have to play or should be playing. And there are certainly questions related to uh, what kind of governance should be uh, in, in the Gaza Strip moving forward. Thank you so much for that question. Hmm. So interesting. So much to, to consider. Another question in the chat is about the Republican Jews who are so focused on the the few radical left um, and blame them for everything. It, it's so polarizing. Can you speak to that? Is there anything that well, we can do? Uh, Shauna, you all in Vegas will have something very um, special that if you're interested. This weekend, 
the Republican Jewish Coalition is coming to Las Vegas and they're going to have their conference and all of these candidates, all of the presidential candidates will be speaking to uh, the leadership of the uh, Republican Jewish Coalition. So you're right there. And hopefully uh, you will be able to hear firsthand what um, these folks have to say with regard both to the Democratic left, but also with regard to Israel and their view of, of how the United States should position itself. So it will be a real interesting moment. And the, the Las Vegas Jewish community gets sort of first shot at this <laughs> since it's your home turf. I did a book on Donald Trump and his impact on American Jews in Israel. And I'm not pushing that book on you. I'm just referencing because Trump is a important uh, uh, player that we need to understand and his impact on Israelis between two, uh, 2016 and 2020 was particularly significant. And Israeli public opinion of, of toward him is a is a subject that deserves its own uh, treatment at some point. And my colleague who wrote the chapter uh, in in this volume on on uh, on how Israelis perceive Donald Trump um, gave a, what I thought was a very fair and very carefully constructed assessment of of the impact that Trump had on on Israel. It's Israeli politics. Um, and um, I, I would only add to that that I think that the prime minister has a long and uh, interesting history with both Donald Trump, but also with Joe Biden. And that Biden-Netanyahu connection showed up very well last week uh, and is very important in the context of this moment. Yeah, I've been very happy with his speech. So sort of wrapping up because we're getting close to the end of our program. I just wanted to, to ask or bring back to the moving forward. Um, you've identified some things like pursuing Zionist education um, and retelling the Zionist story and history. Um, what are some of the resources that Jewish communities, mm -hmm. primarily in Las Vegas, I'm thinking the synagogues, mm -hmm. um, but you know, anything, else? what are resources out there that are developing some good wow. programming for us? Excellent. Uh, I don't know if Las Vegas has a JCRC, Jewish Community Relations Committee. Many communities do. The San Francisco JCRC has an extraordinary web page with all these resources, um, but that's just one. Um, our reform movement has a significant number of resources, both through the Religious Action Center, but also through the URJ directly and through ARTSA, the, um, you know, our, our partner, our Israel Reform Zionist partners, and for sure, um, various other national Jewish organizations, including the uh, major ones, the American Jewish Committee, the Anti-Defamation League, the Jewish Federations of North America, and a significant number of others have been producing and are now producing materials to share with their communities, their members, and the larger Jewish community, all kinds of materials. For example, the ADL and the AJC have a Q&A about the Hamas issues that, you know, help add to what I've hopefully offered tonight and maybe take you deeper into some of the issues. Uh, there's some wonderful stuff that APAC has produced as well. So there are all these resources uh, on the national and in some cases local scene that can be useful. I hope that's helpful, Shauna, to our callers. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment in the chat from Arlene. Thank you, Dr. Windmuller. This was fascinating, informative, and leaves us with a much clearer picture of the present day reality. Thank you again. She looks forward to next week and part two of the presentation. Yes, and I plug a plug for next week. Rabbi Baden and Rabbi Axelrod, I, again, I appreciate your uh, inviting me in. Next week, we'll really take a look at what maybe some of this will mean in terms of the American Jewish future and how American Jews are, in fact, at the moment and over the past 23 years in this century, really reshaping the Jewish, uh, the Jewish landscape. Thank you all. Have a great week. I look forward to having you all back. There's no final exam. It's just fun of learning and sharing together and i really appreciate the quality of your questions thank you thank you thank very you. much very dr windmuller wonderful
Uh, one final plug. Those of you who want to stand with Israel, I have this on October 29th at 6 p.m. in front of the forum shops at Caesars Palace, the IAC in combination with uh, the Board of Rabbis, Jewish Nevada, ADL, all, all the different you know, organizations are sponsoring that. That will be this Sunday at 6 p.m. So we ask that you can join the rally. And um, we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Same Zoom channel, same Zoom time. Rabbi Baden, would you like to add any uh, final words? Oh, just thank you so much, Dr. Winmuller, and thank you to everybody for your participation, your very good questions and comments. And thank you, Rabbi Axelrod, for uh, hosting tonight's session. All right. You're the host next week. So back All at you. right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Shauna, for, for running the tech and Leslie for running the uh, publicity. We look forward to it. Yeah. And thank you, Jonathan Marks, for putting into the chat um, a, cut, a link for the Hamas Covenant. If you hadn't seen it before as a guest, you know, as a participant, click on it. You can read what their covenant says before you leave. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. See you next week, everyone. Good night. Right. Thanks so much.